Hello, I'm Guy Barker. I'm a Microsoft Senior Dev in Accessibility. And I'm Peter Frem. I'm a Senior Program Manager in Office. And we are passionate about accessibility. At Microsoft, we believe everyone should have equal access to information and experiences. We want to share what we've learned over the many years we've been working on accessible software. Designing and programming for accessibility is important, fulfilling, and necessary. We also know it can sometimes feel a little daunting. So we want to show you how Microsoft's Accessibility API, or UIA, can help. We're going to share accessibility best practices you can incorporate into your daily routine. We know there will always be bugs, but in this course, we will give you the tips to avoid the most common ones. Amazing things are happening right now with accessibility, and we're excited to have you be a part of it. This is very exciting. By making our products accessible, we are enabling everyone, including people with disabilities all over the world, to do their best work. Hi, I'm Allie, and I'm here to guide you through this course and ensure you are prepared to design and develop accessible products for everyone. Are you ready? Let's go. First, we're going to learn a little more about Microsoft's Accessibility API, called User Interface Automation, or UIA, and why it's essential in building the best products for our customers. Hello, Peter here. And Guy, let's start things off with a quick overview. So, what is UIA? UIA, or User Interface Automation, is Microsoft's Accessibility API. Let's begin by diving into UIA and how we can use it to make an application accessible to all users. And that's what it's all about. Equal access for all users. And that's why we're so excited about this. UIA can ensure that assistive technologies can access important and useful information about what is happening in a particular user interface. Such as whether a button is pressed, a menu is expanded, or an item is selected. Precisely. ATs such as screen readers or speech recognition programs use this information exposed through UIA to give the user information to help them navigate and interact effectively with an interface. Let's take the bold button in the Home tab of the Microsoft Word ribbon as an example. Examples are great. We want to make this as clear as possible. That we do. That we do. Visually, there is a square on the screen with a capital B that represents a button. We call it the bold button because we know its purpose. The color of the button tells me if it's on or off. It's part of this collection of commands and controls for the font group on the home tab within the ribbon. Those visual characteristics are represented programmatically through UIA, meaning the control type is button, its name property is bold, and its accelerator key is control plus B. How that button behaves, or the patterns associated with that button, are also part of how UIA makes this element accessible. When the bold button is toggled on, the text I enter is bold and stays bold until I toggle it off. This is different from how the change case or increase font size buttons are intended to work. The change case button has a menu associated with it, so it can be expanded or collapsed. When the increase font size button is activated, the font size is increased. All three items are buttons, but each button has a different set of patterns associated with it. This button fits into the hierarchy as part of a larger container of items. The bold button is a child of the font group on the home tab on the lower ribbon. See? A place for everything and everything in its place. Well said. If we as designers, PMs, and developers programmatically expose the visual elements of our UIs by associating the right control types, properties, patterns, and hierarchical position, we make our products accessible and align with the industry standards for compliance, and when we do this, everybody benefits. And that's an exciting prospect. Be aware that the Microsoft Active Accessibility API, or MSAA, is deprecated, so please focus on UIA moving forward. We hope this gives you a clearer picture of UIA. But this is just the beginning. We'll catch you later in the course to share additional learnings about UIA. Before going any further, I want to make sure you've caught all the terms you need to know when discussing UIA. Accessibility refers to equal access to information within your product, regardless of what software or hardware a person may use to interact with your product's user interface. User Interface Automation, UIA, is Microsoft's accessibility API that exposes key information to assistive technologies so a person can navigate and interact with a user interface more effectively.
Assistive technology, or AT, includes software and hardware that can be used by people with disabilities, such as a screen reader or alternative input device. Microsoft Active Accessibility, or MSAA, is the previous version of Microsoft's API that is no longer supported. UIA is the way forward. Hi again, Peter here, together with Guy. Let's talk about designing for UIA. For applications to work best with assistive technology, or AT, designers must peel through the layers of what's in a UI and ensure UIA represents it correctly and completely. So, with any piece of UI, you must know the type of control, such as a button or combo box, you want the user to interact with. Once you know the control type, the stage is set for other user expectations. For instance, when they encounter a link, they expect to be taken to a different section on the page or to a different web page or application. From a designer's perspective, you need to correctly interpret what the control type is. For example, the control type for this element is a button, which is different than the control type of the font combo box. Exactly. Once you know the control type, the MSDN page will give you hints about the properties to consider. Here, for example, is the MSDN page for the UIA button. You can see it has a property related to its help information. You can find keyboard shortcut information. And most important, the name property, which is what a screen reader announces. Let's talk about the hierarchy of elements, shall we? We shall. The last important design element to consider, as Guy points out, is the hierarchy of visual elements. Visually speaking, we see the bold button isn't floating. It is part of a collection of commands that form the set of tools to adjust font style. Stepping back further, the font styles fall on the Home tab of the lower ribbon. Using appropriate nesting of elements within the hierarchy allows for efficient navigation when a person is using touch input, as one example. With Narrator on, a person can swipe to explore the elements in the UIA tree in order. If the hierarchy, including ordering and parent-child relationships, is not clear, touch navigation becomes confusing and frustrating. It's really important to treat any applicable property in its most atomic format. If you pick any one property and jam all the other relevant pieces of information into it, the screen reader, for example, has a hard time dissecting the information and then speaking each piece as it becomes important depending on the user's settings. For example, if a user is not familiar with Office or with text formatting, they may not understand what bold does. So the first time they encounter it, they need details such as its name is bold, its purpose is to make the text bold, and its keyboard shortcut is Control-B. When you break down the properties of the bold button into its name, help information, and keyboard shortcut, various ATs can pull each individually at the user's request, depending on the verbosity level set by the user. I think you were just looking for an excuse to say verbosity. You know me too well. Be sure to pick the correct properties and patterns that are applicable to that particular scenario. Also, keep in mind that some properties are only exposed if their corresponding pattern is enabled. The value property is an example where the information included in that property is not available to the AT unless the value pattern is also supported. For the bold button, we use toggle. For the increase font size button, we use invoke. Although the bold button can in theory be invoked or activated from a keyboard, mouse, touch input, and assistive switch, the state of the button is persistent. It's the change in the color of that button that conveys visually if it is on or off. This aligns more closely to a toggle pattern than an invoke pattern. So, as a program manager, how would you mark up this button for your engineers to implement? First, dissect the screen into individual components that you want the user to perceive, understand, or interact with. We'll start with this template that allows you to fill in the blanks. After you've identified and dissected the pieces of the UI, ask, what is the button trying to communicate to the user? That is the easy part. When you know the type, you can infer the available sets of properties and behaviors. Then, we go back to the MSDN page and look up what these mean. While most of these are there for the developer's purposes, a designer or program manager does certain things when deciding how the button will look and behave visually. After all, our job here is to describe the designer's intentions clearly to an engineer. And clarity is king. In this case, we say the first item is the bold button and the second is the font group. So first, we need to represent a button. Next, we identify what it looks like. Then, we can snap back to the documentation to learn which properties are critical.
Make sure that this button is described programmatically in its properties. First is the name property, which we've called bold. Then, we have some help text property that might be interesting to the user. Finally, for somebody using a keyboard, we've described that we've provided accelerators to make invoking bold much faster. That is one of the properties available on this command. We've also added that in the table here. It is the designer's responsibility to identify whether a keyboard shortcut is necessary so it can be documented and implemented. We've now identified from a user's perspective some of the key things to know about item number one. In the anatomy we've described, it's also important to know what happens when I interact with it directly. This goes back to behaviors or patterns. Then I decide which makes the most sense by asking a few questions. Is this something that would expand or collapse after I trigger it? No, it's not. Is this something that would invoke after I activate it? Probably, but invoke is fairly generic. If I ask the same question for the toggle pattern, it seems the most applicable. At this point, we can hand this off to an engineer and they'll understand that this element on screen needs to be exposed as a button and that these three properties and this one behavior communicate the button's purpose to a screen reader and other ATs. Good design is essential for accessibility. Thanks, and we'll be back to you in a few minutes. Let's recap what you need to know when designing for UIA. Control types are well-known identifiers that can be used to indicate what kind of control a particular element represents, such as a combo box or a button. It identifies what you want the user to interact with on the screen. Having a well-known identifier makes it easier for assistive technology to determine what types of controls are available in the user interface or UI and how to interact with the controls. UIA providers expose properties on Microsoft UIA elements. These properties enable UIA client applications to discover information about pieces of the user interface, especially controls, including both static and dynamic data. The MSDN page will give you hints about properties to consider. UIA uses control patterns to represent common control behaviors. For example, you could use the invoke or toggle pattern for a control that can be invoked or toggled, such as a button, and the scroll control pattern for controls that have scroll bars, such as list boxes or list views. Because each control pattern represents a separate functionality, they can be combined to describe the full set of functionality supported by a particular control. The hierarchy refers to the position a control has in relation to all controls in an interface. For example, a combo box control can be the parent of both an edit control and a list control, and that list control will be the parent of a set of list item controls. If the hierarchy is not clear, it can be confusing to assistive technology. So why do we do all this? because good, accessible design in the beginning is the key to making better, more usable experiences. Assistive technology, or AT, can be part of those experiences. So let's learn how AT comes into play. Hello, Guy here again. And Peter. All right, so we've designed for UIA and it's been implemented. Well done. Now let's see how it all fits together with assistive technologies. There are many ATs that use the UIA Accessibility API. One example is the Narrator screen reader, and another in Windows is Magnifier. Both come pre-installed in Windows. Let me show you what Magnifier looks like. This tool relies on a subset of the UIA data to know where a user is on screen, and then magnify that region. UIA is used by Magnifier to learn when keyboard focus changes and what the bounding rectangle is of the control that's gained keyboard focus. At this point, I'm still zoomed into the document where I was typing and I want to change the way the font looks. I can press the Alt key and notice that focus has moved to the ribbon on the top left of the screen, which is where keyboard focus is right now. As I move around, Magnifier follows. Very cool. Okay, now I'll turn Magnifier off and turn on the narrator screen reader. Document 1, Word window, Document 1, Editing. Narrator just gave me the context of where I am on screen, which is inside the document inside an application called Word. I'm now going to move my focus to the bold button. Off, bold, button alt, H, 1, control plus B. Make your text bold. You've heard the screen reader say, 
Which element we're on? That we're on the ball button. That it's currently off. What its keyboard focus is. And some additional instruction of what that command actually does. The screen reader knows how to do that based on those individual components or anatomy from the UIA data that we've already plugged in, as opposed to it all being jammed into a single property on that element. The screen reader looks at the control type, in this case a button, then for properties like the button's name, in this case bold, its keyboard shortcut or its accelerator keys in this case, the fact that it is a toggleable button, and that it's announced as on versus off. So, there you have it. We broke down the anatomy of this button relative to how the screen reader pulled information from it and what it says to the user. Other ATs work in a similar way. Earlier, you learned about designing for UIA. Now we'd like to show you a couple of tools that can help you find potential bugs and eliminate them in the development process. Guy and Peter will demonstrate a pair of tools available in the Windows SDK that they find invaluable to helping ensure the accessibility of their projects, Inspect and Act Event. There is definitely room for improvement in the usability of these tools, but they offer certain functionalities that can be useful in learning about UIA. Be prepared to answer a couple of questions at the end of each demonstration. Back again. Thanks for staying with us as we get into the Inspect tool. Inspect is a very useful tool available for free from the Windows SDK. I couldn't do my job without it. Same here. It can be useful for finding bugs and verifying they've been fixed. It's not as intuitive or usable as it could be, so I want to explain how I use it. This tool allows devs to learn about the programmatic representation of the UI shown on the screen. Let's continue with our example of the word ribbon. First, we'll look at some buttons on the toolbar. Inspect provides information about the UI that lies beneath the mouse cursor or what has keyboard focus. I'm turning the keyboard focus tracking option off by tapping on this dotted outline rectangle in the Inspect toolbar. But I will leave the mouse cursor option set. For this demo, I will turn on an option that will highlight, with a yellow box, the UI element that Inspect is interacting with. I also turn on the yellow box setting. I just find it easier to follow. That's the goal. Next, through the Options menu, I will specify the kind of UIA information I'm interested in. Inspect can report information about elements that are exposed through the raw view of the UIA hierarchy of elements, the UIA tree. But I'm usually only interested in UIA elements in the Control view, which is a subset of the raw view. The Control view exposes all elements that are of interest to the customer, including all controls that they can interact with, and all text elements that provide them with important information. Next, I'll move to the bold button on the ribbon and, ta-da, the yellow box appears around the bold button. What happened in the left pane of the inspect window is that the element beneath the mouse cursor became highlighted. So now I'll move back to inspect and select that element. We'll check the hierarchy of that element to see how it relates to other elements being exposed through the UI. This hierarchy looks fairly intuitive. We love intuitive UI. Indeed. Before the element is a button called Clear Formatting, and after the element is a button called Italic. All those elements are child elements of a group whose name is Font. The hierarchy looks good, and it seems to match the hierarchy of the visual showing in Word. Now, I'm going to look at some of the properties associated with the elements that represent the bold button. They are showing in the right pane of the Inspect window. Here is a name property with the value of bold. That is very important because it will concisely tell the user the purpose of that element in an accurate and localized way. Exactly. Note that only the B is shown visually. It doesn't say bold. Word set the accessible name property to be something useful. There are other useful properties too. There's a control type beneath the name property, and that has a control type of button. So that tells you the meaning of this control. That's very important. There are a number of other important properties as well. For example, the bounding rectangle shows him where the control is on the screen and represents the target this button has for touch input. Correct. In addition to properties, here on the right pane is information about the UIA patterns that this element supports. The pattern is related to the behavior of the element. As I scroll down, a number of properties are revealed that show what UIA patterns are available. For example, can it be invoked? 
I find that the isInvoke pattern available property has a value of false, which tells me it cannot be programmatically invoked. But then, if I check the isToggle pattern available property, I see that it is set to true. So this button can be controlled using the toggle pattern instead of the invoke pattern. Any other advice we should know about when using inspect? Funny you should ask. I was just going to right click on the document and move down to the synonyms menu. If I were to go to inspect here with watch mouse cursor enabled, as soon as I click into the inspect UI, the whole transient UI of the synonyms menu disappears. Which is not helpful when you want to examine the content of the synonyms menu. Not at all. So, in that case, I can have a tooltip shown when the mouse cursor moves over an element to report specific properties that I'm interested in. To do that, I go to the Options menu, Settings, and in the right area, I'll scroll down to the properties I'm most interested in. By default, How Found, which is through the mouse cursor in this case, and the name of the elements is shown. But today, I'm also interested to see whether the toggle and invoke patterns are supported by the elements. Select OK. Next, I'll turn on that setting to show the tooltip and minimize inspect. Now, I'll move to the bold button. There, I'm told that the name of the button is bold. It does not support the invoke pattern, but it does support the toggle pattern. Then, I go to the decrease font size button. I am told the invoke pattern is true and the toggle pattern is false. If I go back to the context menu, I'm told for a menu item in the synonyms menu that invoke is true and toggle is false. And that, as they say, is that. I know this is very detailed, but these are some of the learnings we've had when exploring how to best use Inspect. So we wanted to share these tips and tricks. Now, on with the course. Let's see what you've learned. In Inspect, which of the following does the control view expose? More than one of the following options may apply. A. All hidden elements. B. All actionable elements in the interface. C. All elements of interest to the customer. Or D. All of the above. If you chose B. All actionable elements in the interface and C. All elements of interest to the customer, you are correct. The control view in Inspect exposes all actionable elements in the interface, as well as all elements of interest to the customer. Let's try another one. In Inspect, if the Show Information Tooltip button is selected, it will only report the default properties, true or false. If you chose false, you are correct. You can customize the tooltip to reflect the specific properties that you are interested in by changing the settings in the Options menu. Congratulations, you have completed this knowledge check. Welcome back. Guy here again. And Peter. In this video, we'll be covering Accavent. Since we've learned about the hierarchy of elements, control types, properties, and patterns in the Inspect demo, let's talk about what events are raised through UIA. Events let the customer know about changes happening in the UI. Let's open AccEvent. There are two main parts to the AccEvent interface. The menu, which offers tools and settings, and the results window, which takes up much of the majority of the UI. Here are a few settings I like to customize. In the mode menu, I check UIA events. Devs at Microsoft, like me, care a lot about UIA events. So be sure to have that menu item checked and not the two items beneath it relating to the legacy win events. Now in that same menu, I'm going to select Settings. In here, I can check boxes for the events I want to investigate and choose an item from the Scope pane to specify from which window AccEvent should listen to events. The top left of this window is a checkbox which allows me to say whether I want Focus Changed Events to be reported by AccEvent. Focus Changed Events are very important events that a UIA client app like Narrator will react to, so I'll check that. There are a lot of other events you can highlight too, like whether a menu or window has opened or closed. That's right. For example, I'll scroll down a bit, 
If I want to know whether the name property of an element has changed, I would check the name box. If I want to know about the toggle state of a control, I scroll down to the toggle toggle state item here and check that box. By doing so, AccEvent will report three events being raised by UI. Focus changed events, name property changed events, and toggle toggle state changed events. And it's called toggle toggle state because I'm interested in the toggle state property exposed through the toggle pattern. Personally, I just like to hear you say toggle toggle state. I know you do. On the far right of this window, I can select what properties I want AccEvent to tell me about for the element that raised a particular event. By default, I'm told two critically important pieces of information, the control type of the element that raised it and its name. So I often leave those as the properties I'm interested in. The final thing I do in this window is say which UI I am interested in. So if I want to know about all the events raised by any UI on my desktop, I would select Desktop in the middle pane Label Scope. Right now, we will just look at events being raised from the Document 1 Word window. And if no element is selected in this middle pane, AccEvent will send you an error message. Right. I'll leave the default checkboxes set up to say I want events reported in order to learn about events that are raised by the Document 1 Word window and all its descendants. So I'll select OK. Now I go back to the main AccEvent window. Select the Events menu and say Start Listening, which will mean AccEvent will report UIA events that are being raised by UI. AccEvent always reports a few initialization steps in the beginning, but now it's waiting for events to be raised. It would be rude of me to make it wait. Would it? Most likely. So if I switch into the Document 1 Word window, AccEvent reports that a focus changed event was raised, and it was raised by an element whose name is Document 1. The control type of that element is a document control type, which tells me that Word has now raised a focus changed event to say that keyboard focus has moved into that window as I selected it. So I'll use the keyboard and tab through the elements on the ribbon. As I do, AccEvent reports that there are a number of focus changed events being raised. In fact, one is being raised as I tab. If I press the tab key now, I expect a focus changed event to be raised by the Format Painter button, because that tells me that keyboard focus has moved to that button. That event also allows a screen reader, like Narrator, to tell the user that they have reached the Format Painter button. I'll press Tab now, and there we have the Focus Changed event, meaning that a Focus Changed event was raised by the Format Painter element. Well, that was eventful. Yes, yes it was. Further up in that list of events raised, there was a Property Changed event. A tab item on the ribbon raised a property changed event, saying that the name property had changed to Home. That happened when I hit Alt-H to move keyboard focus to the ribbon. I'm going to keep on tabbing until I reach the bold button. As I did that, I got a number of focus changed events as keyboard focus moved between the various buttons. Now that keyboard focus is at that button, I'm going to use the keyboard to toggle the state of that bold button. When I did that, a property changed event was raised by the UI. Yes, and from the information in the Act event window, we can tell that the control that raised it was a button control. Its name was bold, the property that changed was on the toggle pattern, and it was a toggle state property. Act event reports that the value of that property is now on, which matches the visuals on the screen. When I press the spacebar to toggle the button, the button looks like it's been depressed. If I do that again, AccEvent tells me that the focus moved into the document. So I'll move keyboard focus back to the ribbon, release the bold button by hitting Alt-H1, and there you go. So now, AccEvent reports that the property changed event again is raised by the bold button. And this time, the toggle state property has a value of off. Exactly. Wow, thanks, Guy. That was a great demonstration. A lot of information here, but well worth it. Yes, hang in there, everyone. This is important work, and the dividends are that we make products that are great for everyone. Let's see what you've learned about AccEvent. You've been assigned to a bug that reports that after activating a button, keyboard focus is not where the user expected it to be.
You use AccuVent to investigate. What setting will you enable to make sure AccuVent notifies you when focus changes? A. Focus changed event. B. Grid item row. C. Toggle toggle pattern. Or D. None of the above. If you chose A, Focus Changed Event, you are correct. Focus Changed Event will reveal what events are being raised that impact the keyboard focus for the user. Let's try one more. Using AccuVent, you learn that when you tab to the button, there is no Focus Changed Event raised. What is likely the reason for that? A, the button is not using a standard button control type. B, the user is doing something incorrectly. C, the name on the button is incorrect, or D, the hierarchy is too complex. If you chose A, the button is not using a standard button control type, you are correct. When using a standard control, you inherit a good amount of programmatic accessibility. When using custom controls, you become responsible for making your control accessible, which takes more time and effort. In this case, the person who built that button started with a custom control and did not do the work to make it programmatically accessible. Congratulations, you've completed this knowledge check. Are you ready to put this all together? Now, Guy and Peter will demonstrate how many of these concepts come together. One thing to know as you watch the next video, implementation will differ based on which UI framework you are using. It's us, Guy and Peter. And this segment we are calling How to Do It Right. It shows you how to make sure that the customer has a great experience interacting with your product through UIA. Earlier, you heard that PMs consider the ways an element shown on the screen might be represented through UI automation. So let's look at this button which shows the text A with a red filled rectangle beneath it that visually indicates text color. The PM knows that the color must be conveyed programmatically so users of assistive technology can access it. So the PM chose a useful, localized, and accessible name, font color. Often, using a standard control supplied by the UI framework will give developers a jump start at fulfilling the requirements the PM set out. So you actually prefer standard controls? I do, because when you start creating custom controls, you don't know how much extra work you may create too, and it could be a lot. So now we will switch to Visual Studio, and see how that button is actually implemented. There is a standard button control being used to present visuals. And inside that button, there is a text block whose text is A with a filled rectangle beneath it. Switching back to the app, we'll point Inspect at that button and hover. Inspect expanded the UIA tree and reveals where the button lies in the UIA tree of elements. That button is contained within a window element whose name is Value Button and that window element is contained within another window element of the same name. Does that button contain any child elements? To find that, move over the text shown in the button and inspect reveals a separate element being exposed through UIA. When I see that, I'm really interested in what view of the UIA tree I'm looking at. So I go to the options menu and confirm that I'm looking at the control view of the UIA tree. That means, that both the text block and the button are being exposed through UIA through the control view. By doing so, I'm saying that both elements are of interest to my customer. But as a customer, I consider that whole control to be a single element of interest, a button. Fair enough. So I will remove that text block element from the control view of the UIA tree, so when the user interacts with the UI, they only find the button, not what's contained within it. To remove an element from the control view, I'll switch back to Visual Studio and I'll edit the XAML. I'll use Automation Properties Accessibility View equals Raw. I'll run the app again, start inspect, point it to that button and select the A text. Now the text block is not found and when I try to expand that element, there is no element being exposed. That means any screen reader that does hit testing over the UI won't find that text block. That seems much better for the user, right? Right, indeed. So, let's look at the right side of the UIA window to see the properties being exposed by this element. The control type is being exposed as button, which is great. 
The bounding rectangle shows me where and how large the control is, and it also shows many helpful properties such as is enabled and is keyboard focusable. Overall, that looks correct. It does. However, one essential property is not being exposed. Which is? The name property. The name property must be accurate, concise, and localized, and convey the meaning of this button to the user. To set an accessible name, I'll add an X UID to the button and call it font color button. Then, I can add localized resources, which will be referenced by this button. I'll then open up the strings and go to the localized string resources for the app. Earlier, I added a localized string resource of font color as the accessible name of this button. This is very similar to how I would set a localized visual string that is exposed on the button. There, I would do font color button dot content, but here I set automation properties dot name. Now, I'll run the app again, start inspect and point it to the button. It shows the accessible name of font color, which completes the set of properties that the assistive technology needs. Well, look at that. One simple change and the properties are sorted out. Next, my PM told me that a value for the button must be exposed through UIA, which reflects the current color associated with the button. That value is exposed through the UIA value pattern in a property called value. On the right side of inspect, I will scroll down to determine if this control supports the value pattern. And its property is false. True. I mean, correct. The property is indeed false. Since I need the value pattern exposed here, I will enhance the accessibility using the XAML UI framework. Very convenient. Now, I'll close Inspect and the app and switch back to Visual Studio. I'll add a new control that would derive from the button control and call it a value button. Because it derives from a button control, it's automatically as accessible as a button control. I'll then add another new class called a value button automation peer, and that will derive from a XAML class called button automation peer, which provides all the accessibility for a button control. In order to tell UIA that my new value button automation peer is to be used with my value button, I override the method onCreateAutomationPeer and return an instance of my new value button automation peer. When I run the app, my new value button has all the accessibility of a regular button but now I want to enhance that accessibility to support the value pattern. First, I will have my new automation peer inherit from the UIA iValue provider interface. I'll then override a method called getPatternCall, which is called by UIA to ask, is this pattern supported by this control? I'll add a special check to say, if UIA wants to know if the value pattern is supported, then I'll say, yes, it is. And the object that implements that pattern is this automation peer. At this point, you haven't added support for it, correct? Yes. So next, I go to MSDN, find the various properties and methods associated with this pattern, and add support to them in this automation peer. There is a method called setValue, which allows a UIA client to programmatically set the current value on this control, and then two properties for is the value read-only, and in this case, we'll say that it's false, and also a property to get the current value. While I've hard-coded the value to be read here, that wouldn't be the case in a shipping app because the string would be localized. Having done that, I'll now run the app, and again, I'll point inspect to this new control and see what patterns it now supports. This is a lot of information. Yes, but it all becomes clear as you go. OK, I'll scroll down, and before we get to the value pattern, let's take a quick look at the isInvoke pattern available. That property is true. And that's because the button automation peer that was used to create the new value button automation peer already supported the invoke pattern. Scroll down further, and you'll notice that the is value pattern available property is now true as well. Next, let's take a look at the properties being exposed through the value pattern on this control. There are two properties being exposed through the value pattern. One is read only, which is false, because we specifically hard coded that in the code and the other is the current value, which is red. Now, let's go to the setValue method in the Actions menu and have Inspect programmatically call that method in the code we just wrote and set a particular value. So let's type blue and execute. There we go, the value is now blue. We have now updated or enhanced the default accessibility of this button to support the value pattern. So, quick review. We've seen the hierarchy, the properties and the patterns. 
But one last thing we should check here is events associated with that control. Am I right? You are. By default, it's a standard button control base, so a lot of useful events will already be raised. However, I've just enhanced the accessibility of this control to support the value pattern. That means I've got to be sure when the value of the value property changes that the event is raised to allow the screen reader to know that the value has changed. So I'll reduce the size of the inspect window here and bring up the ACK event tool. I'm going to change the settings in ACK event to say I'm interested in knowing when the value property of this element changes. So I'll clear existing events that are already being reported here. Now I'm going to have the value value event reported. I'm going to say I'm interested in events being raised from the out window. By the way, it's called value value here because it is the value property of the value pattern. Hmm, value value. Doesn't have the same ring as, say, toggle toggle? Ah, uh, you have a point. So I will listen for events and I'll switch to the app. I can tap to the button control and have focus changed events raised by default. And I'll point inspect to this. I will say, Currently, the value of this control is blue. And I'm going to change that to say green. Hit execute and close it. When I did this, ACK event reported no property change events were raised. That's very important because it means as the value of that property changed from one color to another, there was no event raised to let a screen reader announce it to the user. So there is one more step to have an event raised to give a screen reader a chance to react to the change. So I'll close down the app and take us back to the setValue method we used earlier. This is where a UIA client calls in to say, I want the value of this element changed. We did change the value, but we need to take one additional step to have an event raised to let UIA and UIA clients, like a screen reader, know of the change. So now we will run the app and I'll run inspect and ACK event. Because inspect remembers the previous settings, I just say, report events from this window. Then. I go back to the button, look at its current value, it's probably red, the default for this demo app, and say, change that value from red to yellow again. Execute and close. Ack event then reports a number of focus changed events as before, but also a property changed event. It says, the sender of this event is a button control, whose name is font color, and it's a value property of the value pattern that has changed. And its new value is yellow. Now, a screen reader can detect the change in the value of that button and let the screen reader use a no. We are convinced that the programmatic accessibility of this control is a great experience for the customer. In other words, we did it right, just like we said at the beginning. Thank you for joining us for these demonstrations, everyone. The adventure is ongoing. We look forward to further developing UIA as Microsoft's accessibility API to not only make products better, but to help make the tools we use more effective. We've covered a lot of information in this course. Let's take a few minutes to see what you have learned. You want to include a button in your app that has a unique design. What initial steps should you take? More than one of the following options may apply. A, verify if there is a way to build that button by adding visual enhancements to a standard button control. B, if a standard control is not possible, Estimate the time it will take to create custom buttons and make them accessible. C. If a standard control is not possible, discuss with your lead the extra work that will be required. Or D. Go ahead and make the custom button and hope that it doesn't get a bug. If you chose A, B, and C, you are correct. Standard controls inherently include programmatic accessibility. When building a custom control, you become responsible for adding the accessibility properties and behaviors, including keyboard access. This adds time to the development of your UI and runs the risk of unexpected bugs during testing. Congratulations, you got the approval to build the buttons. Now you need to ensure that the visual characteristics are represented programmatically through UIA which characteristics are essential. More than one of the following options may apply. A, patterns. B, control types. C, properties. Or D, where it is in the hierarchy. If you chose all the options A, B, C, and D, you are correct.
All of these characteristics are essential for assistive technologies to work properly. You completed the development of the button. Now you want to use AccEvent to check that the UI is being correctly relayed to the customer. When you first open AccEvent, which settings should you check? More than one of the following options may apply. A. UIA events. B. Win events in context. C. Win events out of context. Or D. Focus changed events. If you chose A. UIA events and D. Focus changed events, you are correct. These are the first items to check when starting Ac event. They are essential pieces of information that must be reported to the user. You made good use of your time deciding on the control types and properties and want to be sure you haven't introduced bugs in the process. What's your next step? Again, more than one of the following options may apply. A. Use the Inspect tool to confirm the design of the buttons matches the representation in UIA. B. Use an assistive technology, such as the narrator screen reader, to test the user experience with your UI. C. Use AccEvent to ensure the rotation property changed event is invoked. Or D. Use the Inspect tool to ensure that the button is placed correctly in the hierarchy. If you chose A, B, and D, you're correct. Inspect is used for finding and fixing bugs as well as learning about the programmatic representation of UI that is shown on the screen. Congratulations, you have completed this knowledge check. You're likely to have questions as you start using UIA. We've put together answers to some frequently asked questions to help you avoid common pitfalls. Is there a UIA property called role? Role is often used to refer to an element on the web as referenced in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. Although technically, there is a legacy I accessible role in UIA, we should pay more attention to the control type property in UIA. Control type best aligns with the modern concept of role. How do I know if I've used UIA correctly? Verify all your control types are using the available patterns or behaviors from the UIA spec on MSDN for that kind of control type. As you gain confidence in UIA design and implementation, it might be helpful to also test with an assistive technology, such as a screen reader, to get a sense of what experience you are building for the customer with your choices in UIA implementation. Help! I just can't get UIA to do what I want it to. What can I do? UIA is still evolving, and more functionalities will be added. In addition to UIA, the framework in which you are building may have some limitations around accessibility. Check out the Microsoft Windows UI Automation blog for guidance and examples. I've never used assistive technology before for testing. Where should I start? There is a whole ecosystem of assistive technology that can run on Windows. To determine which type of assistive software to begin testing with, first learn what kinds of assistive tools your customers use. There is a suite of assistive tools in the Ease of Access Center that comes pre-installed on Windows. A product like Narrator will help you get a sense of how UIA is being handled in your app. I still need help with UIA. Where do I go? The Windows Developer Support site is a great resource to leverage. I'd like to learn more about accessibility. What is available? The Microsoft Accessibility homepage is a great place to start. And thank you for wanting to learn more. We knew you were smart. Let's quickly summarize what has been covered. One. UIA is Microsoft's accessibility API that ensures assistive technologies can access important information about how a person can navigate and interact with an interface. Two, the key characteristics of UIA are control type, properties, patterns or behaviors, and hierarchy. Three, you should always prioritize standard controls over custom controls.
Four, designing with the user in mind from the beginning will ensure a seamless workflow, less bug remediation, and better, more accessible products. Thank you for learning more about Microsoft's Accessibility API, UIA. We hope you've learned a few best practices from Guy and Peter, and we're excited about the experiences you will go and create with that knowledge.